So my uh, title is uh, Early Detection of Prostate Cancer, Navigating the Challenges in 2021 uh, and a Pathway Forward. My disclosures are on the bottom of my uh, slide here. So um, anyway, my learning objectives with this are we want to understand the challenges of early detection, develop a pathway forward to identify high-risk patients, role of markers, which I think are very important, and high-risk men, and then a little bit about the economics. As a group, and I've asked this question at, at this meeting a couple of times uh, with some renditions of this talk, and I ask people, are you satisfied with the current state of prostate cancer early detection, yes or no? Is anybody happy? Raise their hand. Usually one person raises their hand. A lot of people have concerns, and they have concerns for a whole bunch of different reasons. If you look at uh, the, the main game players here, there are family practice physicians and urologists that are involved with early detection. Uh, they each have different concerns, uh, screening parameters. Is there a cutoff for age, informed decisions, risk and benefits? But if you really talk to both specialties, they believe there is an intrinsic value in early detection of some men with prostate cancer, and it's our job to find out who they are. Um, this was an airline that flew into this airport not too long ago, PSA Airlines. Um, it was flying high for a while, and like many airlines, uh, is out of business. This is called the world's shortest vacation, uh, and it's also a video screw up here, but on my part, the U.S. Services Preventive Task Force raised some concerns about prostate cancer early detection. And uh, rightfully so, somebody needed to make a correction. And I agree with a lot of the stuff they said, that we needed to stop overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So thought about it, a lot of people have, a lot of different approaches, various other things like that. But I think you have to take a breath, sit back and say, where does screening start? Who do we have to educate? How can we do it? And how can we navigate through this and make it into something that is potentially beneficial to the patients? So we start out with family practice, and I'll show you in a minute. 90% of PSAs are ordered by them. The problem is we confuse them uh, immensely with all sorts of things we have. We have cutoffs of 2.5, 4, we have PSA velocity, PSA density, H-specific PSA, percent-free PSA, complex PSA, 5, PCA3, select MDX, 4K, it goes on and on and on, and they say help. We can't, you know, if we have all these age-specific, and I saw some guidelines that just came out uh, last week and some proposals. We need a simple message from them. Every, nothing is going to be perfect. We can't, we have to do the best we can, and I think that's what uh, we should uh, go forward with it. Here's the data that shows you that 90% of the PSAs ordered in the United States are ordered by family practice. This is a couple of years old, but it's still pretty high. So, PLCO trial, it was one of two of the big trials that was the one that was done in the U.S. We were one of the sites, Dr. Andriol was a principal investigator. We published this in New England Journal of Medicine and a number of other articles, and it gave us the first hint that if you had a PSA that was less than one or low, your chances of getting into trouble in the next five years were pretty small. And so that's where this one came up with. So I went to this Henry Ford database, and it's a pretty homogeneous database. It has uh, uh, about 29% African Americans. They have good follow-up. They have treatment that's well-balanced and things like that. And what we did was inquire about, is there a PSA cutoff below which you don't get in any trouble? And so we said you had to be over, uh, we wanted uh, a group of men um, that would fit into the criteria for screening. We found 21,000 that did. And what we found was that if your PSA was less than 1.5, you had a 0.5% chance of having a prostate cancer in the next five years, and of those, there was only one that was a significant cancer. However, if you're 1.5 to 4, you're in a danger zone, and that danger zone is not just for prostate cancer, but it's for BPH and other things like that. This falls into the topic we're talking about right now is prostate health. 
And if you do a ROC curve with PSA of 1.5, 0.87 ain't bad. So 1.5 to 4 is sort of, to me, a danger zone. I'm not going to argue with people if they say it's 2, 2.2, something like that, 1.3. You know, that gets us nowhere, and that's what we've been doing for the past couple decades is arguing about fine little details. We need something that's broad and that, that family practice doctors uh, uh, who do most of the screening can be accepted. So 1.5, what's the most common cause for an elevated PSA in this age group? It's not prostate cancer, it's BPH, but it's prostate health. Large prostates many times, not all times, are synonymous with obstructive uropathy and progression. And we've done studies uh, that Jerry Andriol and I and others have been involved with, um, with, uh, with the MTOPS, which showed the value of finasteride and things like that and so forth, and alpha blockers. Prostate cancer, long-term risk of prostate cancer. That's a good one. Our friends in Scandinavia have shown that. Uh, and you don't biopsy everyone that has a PSA of greater than 1.5. We're not saying that. We're just saying, hey, take a closer look. So here's the, the naysayers say, oh, my gosh, if we cut, have this cut off at 1.5, we are going to overflow. There's going to be a flood of, of patients going to urologists and family practice. They can't handle it. Well, so what we did is we went to a large bioreference lab that had a lot of PSAs and did them. 400,000 PSAs, and guess what? 73% of PSAs were less than 1.5, okay? 20% were between 1.5 and 4. So right away, we're throwing out 80% of men. We're looking at 20% that we want to sort of watch or do another test on. And this is, this is what I, proves what, it, this is something we published from MTOP showing that as your prostate size increases, so does your PSA. So PSA size is a surrogate, so that's the BPH component. We published this thing back in urology a few years ago, and so these markers do make sense. So then what happens is, okay, how do these, some of these new markers, like um, they're out there, like 4K score, select, M, uh, select MDX, PHI, which is a great test, PCA3, and work. So we looked at it with our database and said, and some of these are isoforms of PSA, so you can understand it's a problem. But what happens is that they will work. Select MDX was perfect with a PSA cut off of less than 1.5. Um, but uh, you can make an adjustment with a PHI uh, and 4K score. So they work too. So it's not like you're throwing these tests out. They're still good. Early detection, a way forward. That's the other thing that, that sort of bothers me is that, oh, you have to have an informed decision with the patient before you're screening. How many of you have had an informed decision when you went to your family practice doctor and they checked your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your pulse, anything like that? Did they get an informed decision? Why do you have to get an informed decision to get a PSA? You do it after the test is abnormal. That's what they do with all these other things. With your, if your cholesterol is elevated, then they give the informed decision about using uh, statins and other things like that. So PSA can fall into the same category. And there are a, a plethora of articles out there. This is one that came out uh, just a year ago uh, about the decision aids don't work, uh, didn't make, make much difference. Uh, this has been shown in, in, in family practice li literature too about breast cancer and colorectal and other things about the the value of shared decision making and so forth. It's, good. it's a good thing to talk about, but it's another roadblock. Prostate cancer, we need informed decision. It should happen like other tests, okay? The other thing we should do, we should take a lesson from family practice doctors. When they get an elevated blood sugar on you, do they start you in metformin or insulin? No, what do they do? An A1C hemoglobin. You have an abnormal EKG, do they do a bypass right away? Not usually, they squirt your vessels. If you have an abnormal PSA, you get a biopsy right away. No, you should do something else. You should take a lesson from family practice, and that's what we're gonna talk about, identifying clinically significant cancers. So uh, I, I borrowed this from a, a couple of people, including Dan Lynn, that said PSA alone to guide prostate biopsy should end. We need to reduce unnecessary and stop overdetection. That's nothing new. That's been going on. That's the U.S. Services Preventive Task Force. 
So I want to I want to go through one test that I'm familiar with, select MDX. There's a lot of other ones down there. It would take me 35, 40 minutes to go through every one of these and all of it. But there's a common lesson here that applies to 4K, that applies to my my prostate score, other things like that. And that is you start out with an idea and you have a, a validation study, and this is what was done with this, with uh, the group in Nijmegen and the Netherlands, uh, and also. So what it was, it was a test that was supposed to catch high-risk prostate cancer from urine to tell you to do a biopsy uh, or not to do a biopsy. The reports are pretty simple. Some of the reports can be out there can be pretty uh, overwhelming, but one of them is a negative one. That's the one I like to see. It means you have uh, 97 percent, almost a 90. 7% chance you don't have a high-risk cancer. Positive gives you relative risk of regular prostate cancer. That means any, and then Gleason grade two or above. So how does it fit? It, you can plug in all of these tests here. You have somebody, 1.5 to 4, somebody you're worried about, elevated PSA, do the test, increase risk, move to a biopsy, very low risk, take them back and get them out of the biopsy pool. But, you know, and I want to give this talk. In the, uh, the, when I'm done, somebody's going to come up to me and say, that's a great test, but I ordered the test that was negative, and the guy had a prostate cancer, and it was a Gleason 9, and he died in two years, okay? No test would have helped that guy. You know, lawyers love those tests, those uh, cases. That, those people were doomed before they even started. So screening doesn't work in everybody. Then you look at cost effectiveness. This was this study that was done uh, by Matt Resnick and, uh, and, and the group that showed that the test worked. Then you do, this was uh, one that uh, we just published uh, just a, a few months ago on MRI and the test. And basically what we, sh this was done and I, and I collaborated uh, with the group from Nijmegen and Yale Barnes and, the, and the, uh, who was one of the world authorities on MRI, incorporating the marker, select MDX, into the algorithm to see how it worked. And the conclusions are, I'll read, I'll read it here for you, select MDX as the risk stratification tool for biopsy uh, naive men, avoids unnecessary biopsies in 38% of the time, minimizing low-grade cancer and only misses 10% of high-grade cancers. And that was in their experience. Um, what they do say, if you add NRI, it adds something, but they also say, however, if multiparametric MRI availability is limited, or expensive, or you don't have somebody that's very good at reason, uh, using it, using MRI only and select MDX positive patients is a good alternative strategy, which to me says that you do that before you do MRI in a lot of patients. So conclusions with uh, select with a lot of these studies are uh, is that you have the analytical data, you have clinical data, you have health, health economics, you have approval of the, the states, you have Medicare, various other things like that, guidelines, and so forth. Um, it's interesting, now we're seeing, but we've been fighting for this, now we're seeing some pushback from the guidelines about uh, who can order these tests, uh, who, uh, what ages, what, uh, uh, you know, I, you can argue, I see 80, we all see 80 year old men that are running marathons or who are very active who have a 10-year life expectancy. Um, I remember that when I was uh, at UCLA and then a little bit after that, the guy I trained with did a radical prostatectomy on an 80-year-old man. And I told him he was absolutely crazy because if something happened to that guy, it would, might ruin your career. And that guy was Bob Hope, and Bob Hope lived to be 100. And I can tell you a story about Andrew Shalley, who got the Nobel Prize for LHRH. Andrew's a very good friend of mine. Uh, he was told at age 80, don't get a PSA, age 91. He's got locally advanced prostate cancer, healthy as heck, working every day. He's doing well right now in his, in his mid-90s on LHRH and got radiation. But you have to be, you have to be a little bit flexible. So... We have, these, we have these great markers out there, select, uh, phi is a good test. Uh, the problem with phi is that you, it, we don't have a great way to differentiate low, low risk from high risk, that these things are going on. Same with PCA3, 
MRI, and a whole bunch of other ones. We have a website, PCMarkers.com. Our goal in 2021, I hear everybody talking about, we want to put more patients on active surveillance and Gleason 6s and that. Basically, uh, our goal is not to find Gleason 6 cancers and not to put patients on active surveillance. We should be ahead of the game and determine who needs treatment before. So this is our simple algorithm. It's in PCMarkers.com. Man comes in, routine PSA, less than 1.5, happiness greater than 1.5, caution light, consider referral to a urologist. That urologist shouldn't biopsy that patient, should repeat it, maybe in six months. Maybe you should do a, uh, see what the prostate volume is, AUA symptom score. Unfortunately, family practice doctors don't do AUA symptom scores, things like that, but uh, routinely, and then decide what to do. If you're going to think about a biopsy, uh, that patient is, you do one of these molecular markers that help you if they're uh, low risk, then you go back into the screening pool. If you're high risk, then do whatever you think is appropriate in the way of prostate biopsies um, uh, in, in this patient. And I think that this is where a place MRI comes in or uh, in patients with negative biopsies. So with, with that, I'm going to stop. And uh, I actually did finish pretty much uh, on time.